Next, a who's who of legendary villains and just what it takes to walk on the wild side. Then, the escape of Velma West, a flapper with murderous intent. And some say the city of Gehenna has a notorious name. We find out the truth. Support for Columbus Neighborhoods is provided by... At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance and for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation. Smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri. Your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated, it just needs to be right. CODA. Keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Mortime Marketing and Communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State, changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you. Don't you just love a good villain? Characters like Darth Vader in Star Wars and Voldemort in Harry Potter. The movies always give them the cool costumes and the best lines. In real life, they were gangsters like Al Capone and Jesse James. So what makes a villain here in Columbus? And how far back in history are we talking about? Let's find out. We're at the Ringside Cafe in downtown Columbus. It's a place where hand carvings of ram heads and flowers sit comfortably under imported stained glass windows. And legendary burgers are named after famous boxers like Ali, Smokin' Joe, and Oscar De La Hoya. There's also house cut fries with sea salt and beer battered onion rings. Opened in 1897 and close to the State House, the Ringside Cafe has seen its share of good guys and bad. Historians Ed Lentz and Doreen Juhas Sauer are here to talk about some of the notable villains of Columbus. Well, I gotta tell you, uh, learning about Columbus history as we do this show has been amazing to me, but now we get to talk about the villains of Columbus. Tell me about some of the infamous people that uh, Columbus is known for, or maybe not even known for, that we should be known for. Well, should we define what a villain is first? Yeah, maybe yeah. Make well, sure we've got the same playing field. So we're field? all on the same page, right? Right. What would you say, Ed? Well, I think basically it's not just a person who's a criminal, not just a person who's infamous. I think it has something to do with basically somebody who is doing things that we find either ethically or morally reprehensible mm -hmm. and that may be illegal as well. It's somebody who's now crossed a line of morality, but it has been more of a conscious choice, and it will have repercussions. And you need to remember there is something about the power of place in all of this as well. As the town begins to grow, it will develop a vice district, which in Columbus, more often than not, is called the Badlands. It was a mixed community, a wide variety of ethnic, racial, national groups. Probably the lord and master of most of this is a man named Alexander Smokey Hobbs. He shows up in 1895 in Columbus as a boxer, among other things, and ends up involved with gambling, with involved with a wide variety of sale of illicit drugs of one kind or another, and he's arrested over and over and over again. He'll end up spending seven years in the Ohio Penitentiary for shooting a fray, as they say in the trade. But when he comes out, he promptly gets back into the same business again. But he's the kind of person that if a newspaper can't figure out who's trying to do something evil in town, they'll blame it on Smokey Hobbs. <laughs> when in doubt, blame it on Smokey. When in doubt, blame it on Smokey. <laughs> well, he was uh, certainly a, a, a headline grabber. So you knew you were going to pick up the paper because he would say the most outrageous things just it would appear in print. Things to today you go, oh, I can't believe I just read that. But he's 
part of the group that would have been marginalized. Smokey himself was listed on the census as mulatto. Smokey's married at least three times, so among his other things, he's got to be um, a ladies' man. His first marriage is, I love this, is married to a woman in a church by the Reverend James Poindexter. She lasts about a year with him, and he always seems to be able to pick up another woman. He's running the opium dens, uh, he's running brothels. His best clientele was the fact that the Columbus Barracks, Fort Hayes, were there. In fact, he winds up in federal prison in Atlanta because he has now violated what is essentially a federal law that brothels uh, were to be so many miles away from an army base. Five. Five miles? Mm -hmm. And he violates that, so now it's a federal crime. Right, so, right. He seems to get a little bit of a second wind in prohibition by the very nature of it, because he right. can amass much more than everything else. In a funny way, what his downfall was, he was the ruler of the seventh ward. So he was the go-to guy when the Republicans were always in office at that particular period of time, wanted to turn out the votes and get something done. He was the ward healer. And he could make deals and he could get people to vote. He could pretty much talk himself into anything. And then there was the payoff. They wouldn't touch his vice. But in, by 1912, when good government changes and the, the wards are done away with, he's lost his power base. Mm -hmm. So there is a bit of a decline there, and then you kind of start to watch it go down. I think age and health problems catch up with him by the 1920s. And he really is not heard from all that much from about the 1920s on. He won't die until April of 1934. Boy, it sounds like Smokey Hobbs knew how to take advantage of an opportunity and, and, and the people around it. Anybody else in Columbus that was famous for taking advantage? Oh, I think the opportunists really helped to define what a villain is. One of them is one of the more um, respected businessmen of Columbus in the 19th and early 20th century, and that's uh, Samuel Hartman, who is the inventor of Peruna, the patent medicine. And he was a, a bona fide doctor. He had graduated from medical school in Philadelphia in 1857. Uh, he was not originally from Columbus, but when he arrives here, he uh, is, and like a lot of other doctors at the time, experimenting in his own compounds. And these compounds were there to generally cure everything. And for him, it was, the specialty was catarrh, which was, how would you best describe Congestion. That? When you think of catarrh, you'd think about maybe having congestion of the lungs. Mm -hmm. But according to Hartman, you could have catarrh in any part of your body. Right. You could have catarrh of the hand, or catarrh of the ear, or catarrh of the nose, or catarrh of the knee. And whatever your catarrh <laughs> was, right, right. Peruna, which was the name of an Indian chief who came to Hartman in a dream and revealed the medicine, medicinal formula good that for good for man or beast, <laughs> internal or external, right? Uh -huh. And he just guaranteed that if you drink two pint bottles of Peruna, it would take care of any catarrh that you had. Given the fact that it was predominantly alcohol, pretty easy to see why after two <laughs> bottles of Peruna you don't care what guitar right. you have. Right. But he made a fortune doing this. This is the placebo effect right. unchained. <laughs> 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 that if you believe that colored water will cure you, maybe it will. Right, and he right, makes right. no bones about it. He comes right out in a Collier's Magazine article who's investigating him and says, you know, if you believe you're gonna get well, you're gonna get well, you know? So of course, you know, it, it's curing people. But for me, it's not just that how many people he tricked, people who would have really had diseases that would have gone unnoticed, people who probably died because of this particular diagnosis that he had for them. Part of the advertising was based on what would be his vice president and his son-in-law, Frederick Schumacher, who is known as the father of the testimonial. I'm not even sure Schumacher would have completely been in agreement with exactly how Hartman did this, but it was when he zeroed in on 50 of the top military people out of the Civil War, the, uh, the, uh, the admirals and the generals and others, and he got them to endorse this, most of whom had never, of course, had anything to do with it. And he gave them, he had a sign-off paper and he gave them an anomalous amount of money for doing this. But when an admiral objected to having his name in the paper in this huge ad that was being seen by everyone, and he said, I never used that stuff, you need to retract that, and Hartman said, Hey, you know, I'm happy to retract that, but I'll have to reveal that you signed this piece of paper that said you tried it and you lied oh, and boy. your reputation will be the one that goes down. Wow. And it was, it's, it's that blackmail. And I think the blackmail, it, in my mind, in addition to all of the other bogus things that led up to it, really uh, puts him in the villain category for wow. me.
That's incredible. My, my second favorite villain is the one that is probably most, I think, disputed by other people. And um, I'm assuming you know something about the famous Dr. Snook. Uh, yes, I've yes. heard of him, yes. I think he enjoys a rapid popularity every now and then. Every generation discovers him. And that is the veterinary uh, professor at Ohio State who lives on West 10th Avenue with his wife and his little girl and is a member of King Avenue Church and he's upstanding and he invites, invents the snook hook, which looks like a big knitting needle omen away to perform vasectomies on small animals. And he's seen as a very bookish man and he is lured into sort of the love nest of Theora Hicks. He passes himself off as kind of like a traveling salesman. She's the younger wife. He's in his 40s, she's in her 20s. And she had been a graduate student who had done some work for him. And he murders her over by the quarries and the body is discovered and the the trail gets back to the love nest pretty quickly. The doctor basically used a ball peen hammer, uh, and then when that wasn't sufficient to, to the end, he ended up using a knife to finish the job. Wow. And he had left a wide variety of evidence, as Doreen says, back at that apartment, so it wasn't very hard for local law enforcement to figure out what exactly was happening, and it was one of the more spectacular trials in Columbus history that was followed very closely, day by day, with large amounts of the court transcript reprinted in the newspaper. So the case basically sort of grabbed not only local but national attention at the time, and the doctor was convicted and sent to the Ohio Penitentiary where he was ultimately executed for the murder of Theora Hicks. But what was interesting was started coming out about her and how the papers portrayed her. She's the only child of this very sainted looking couple who truly were bewildered by everything. So she becomes the victim. Um, she is the young girl lured in by the older man. They also can't explain some little things that start to come out in testimony, like she uh, worked fairly menial jobs around the university to help support herself, and her parents did send her money. But suddenly she has well over $1,000 in a bank account, and it's not really known how she gets this. Uh, her roommates are suspicious of her activity. A former boyfriend, uh, for the most part, is also um, part of this in the sense that she had tried a lot of other things with him. So she's the one who is suggesting that they try um, various drugs for a sexual enhancement. Now the story reverses. And because he is the murderer, one would assume he is the villain. Of course, he took this young girl's life. On the other hand, there is nothing about her that suggests that she was naive, innocent, or anything but perhaps very calculating. In other words, this was something she had done up until now in other situations to get what she wanted. I've learned so much. And I've also learned to stay on the straight and narrow. <laughs> <laughs> Then our job is well done. Right. I thank you so much for sharing these amazing stories. Next, the mysterious flapper and her great escape. Then, how hell might have played a role in the naming of Gehanna. Back in the 20s, reporters could sell a lot more papers if they got a good scoop about a sensational crime. Authors came next with crime novels and peppered their stories with slang like bean shooters, glad rags, and dizzy dames. And the more unusual the crime or the criminal, the better. This next story is about a notorious murderess in Ohio, a flapper with a claw hammer. Hi, Brent. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Good. We usually meet in exhibits, mm -hmm. but today we're in archives. What have you found for us? Oh, we have some archival collections related to Velma West. Uh, she was an inmate at the Ohio Reformatory for Women in Marysville. Yeah, she had some rather grisly nicknames, as I recall. She did. They called her the Hammer Murderess or the Hammer Slayer, and she earned that nickname because she murdered her husband. Her husband. He was kind of a home buddy, but she wasn't. She wasn't. You're, you're absolutely correct there. Her husband, his name is Thomas West, and he married Velma in 1926. She was 20.
21. She was very young. Uh, he owned his own nursery business and they lived in Perry, Ohio, which was a, s a rather small town. Mm -hmm. She had all of her friends in Cleveland. She was much more interested in a nightclub lifestyle rather than the life of a housewife. She's a flapper in the jazz age and he isn't. Exactly. She decides to do something about that. She did. According to the story, uh, she wanted to go out to a bridge party with friends on December 6, 1928. Her husband didn't want to go with her. Mm -hmm. They got into a heated argument. Mm -hmm. She went into a blind rage, and as a result of that rage, she took a hammer that she had used earlier that day to fix a window. And uh, she fixed and him. <laughs> she did. She okay. killed her husband and uh, decided to go to that bridge party anyway. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's what happened that night. But she was apprehended pretty quickly. She was. So the next day, she actually went shopping with her mother in downtown Cleveland. She was doing Christmas shopping, and she even bought a gift for Thomas. She bought him 12. She could have scratched him off her list. <laughs> she could have, definitely. She, instead, she bought him 12 handkerchiefs and talked about what a wonderful holiday season they would have together. But the police picked her up shortly thereafter. So she's apprehended. She's found guilty. She's sentenced to the women's reformatory in Marysville. Mm -hmm. But that's not the end of her excitement, is it? It's not. So she is sentenced to life for the crime. But sometime in 1939, she felt the need to escape. That year, she had been denied parole. Mm -hmm. uh, she thought when she was originally sentenced that she would get out maybe in seven to 10 years. Mm -hmm. That turned out to not be the case. Mm -hmm. At the same time, she was suffering from some health ailments, mm -hmm. which made her want to have one last little adventure before she spent her whole life behind bars. And because she'd been a model prisoner, she had some privileges and she took advantage of those to escape from the reformatory. Exactly. The superintendent, Margaret Riley, because she was such a model prisoner, gave her access to some of the keys to the prison. And she also wore street clothes for the most part. Mm -hmm. So she wasn't wearing a prison uniform when she made her escape. They kind of walked out of the reformatory and their journey uh, across several states is documented in this interesting cartoon from the uh, Columbus uh, Citizen Journal. It is. So this was published in 1939 in the Columbus Citizen Journal, and it talks about the route that these women took. Velma West escaped with three other inmates, and they made their way all the way to Dallas, Texas. It was a fascinating trip. You can see that they trudged through the mud and the rain, were picked up by a truck driver in Marion, Ohio, and you can see their path that they took all the way to Dallas, Texas. And within about 40 days, Velma was caught and brought back to the Ohio Reformatory for Women. Where she tells her story to the newspaper in this uh, photograph where she's very chummy with the uh, reporter. Yes, you can see her here with a reporter from Columbus Citizen Journal. She's also with another inmate that she escaped with, Mary Ellen Richards. Before she broke out, she left kind of an apology to the warden, right? She did. So she had a very good relationship with Marguerite Riley. To give you a little bit of context, Marguerite Riley, the superintendent of the reformatory, instituted what they called the human being program. So she offered vocational training for a lot of the women, recreational opportunities to improve the quality of life in the prison and to um, reduce recidivism rates. She wrote this letter to Miss Riley to demonstrate her sadness for having to leave. She felt like this was the one opportunity she would get to experience life on the outside before the end of her life. She recognized that Marguerite showed her a lot of kindness while she was in prison. And it's, it's kind of a sad letter to read, but this was what she left for Marguerite Riley before she escaped. Well, she comes back, she's uh, put in solitary, and then uh, she spends much of her time with another one of her passions, which is music. Yes, Velma West loved to play piano, and it's said that she composed 150 songs while she was behind bars. And these, these photos here show her with some of the music that she composed. And what was her final fate? Did, um, what, what became of Velma? Well, she came up for parole in 1959, um, and she would have been released at that time, but she decided that she wanted to stay in prison. She had no family left, no friends on the outside, and so she was resigned to her fate behind bars. Shortly thereafter, she died, um, October 1959. She was 53 years old, and she succumbed to her physical ailments. She had heart disease. And that is the story of Velma West. Wow, a grisly and fascinating story. Yeah. Thanks for sharing it. Oh, thanks for coming out to hear it.
Columbus, Ohio is named after Christopher Columbus. That's a pretty easy connection. But someone wrote into our Curious Sea Bus staff about the origin of the name Gehanna, and it's a rather unusual question. Curious Sea Bus is WOSU's project where you submit your questions about our region, its people, or its history, and we assign a reporter or producer to investigate it. Today's question comes from Maureen Duffy, who wrote in to ask, is Gehanna really named after hell, or is there another origin for its name? So, why would someone think Gehanna is named after hell? Well, those familiar with the Bible might know that there is a hellish place in the Gospels whose name looks awfully similar to Gehanna. Gehenna is the name of a valley south of Jerusalem. In the Old Testament, it's a place where children were sacrificed to a false god, Moloch. Later, it was described as a receptacle for the city's garbage, where the dead bodies of animals and criminals were discarded and consumed by fire. Basically, it was a burning trash dump. Though Gehenna was a literal place, its name came to be used as a synonym for the realm of eternal damnation. In the King James Version of the Bible and other English translations, instances of the word Gehenna were simply replaced with the word hell. So, where did the name Gehenna actually come from? The key to Gehenna's name comes from the waterway that curves through the center of the city. Before it was known as Big Walnut Creek, it was called the Gehenna River. Gehenna is a Native American word that means three into one. In that area, three rivers literally come into one where Alum Creek, Blacklick Creek, and Big Walnut Creek converge. Technically, that convergence occurs about eight miles south of Gehanna in Three Creeks Metro Park. More specifically, Gehanna got its name because the city was founded on land owned by John Clark in 1849. He named his property Gehanna Plantation or Gehanna Farm. In 1881, after merging with the nearby town of Bridgeport, citizens petitioned for Anklam County to be incorporated as a village. Even though the actual three into one does not occur within Gehanna's borders, the city has embraced that meaning. The city's official seal bears the inscription three in one, and the city's current logo contains three blue waves and their tagline, where currents connect. So, it may soothe your soul knowing that Gehanna is not named after Hellfire, but rather for its connection to water. Do you have a question for Curious Sea Bus? Head over to wosu.org curious to submit your idea, vote on which question we should tackle next, and see what we've covered so far. Thanks for being with us, and remember you can catch all our episodes on ColumbusNeighborhoods.org, plus see our stories on the WOSU mobile app, and you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods. It's not for me to say how the stars lie in birth, how long we get.
support for Columbus neighborhoods is provided by. At American Electric Power, we've been proud sponsors of WOSU Public Media for many years and strong supporters of our headquarters city here in Columbus, both downtown and in neighborhoods like yours. State Auto Insurance Companies, transforming to become a digital provider of auto, home, and business insurance. And for nearly 100 years, committed to the people and neighborhoods of Central Ohio. State Auto. The Columbus Foundation, smart philanthropy for a smart city. ColumbusFoundation.org. Bailey Cavalieri, your relationship with your law firm doesn't need to be complicated, it just needs to be right. CODA, keeps our community moving forward. Falgren Wartime, marketing and communications. Think wider. Ohio Health focuses on you and your family with a mission to improve the health of our communities. Women in Philanthropy at Ohio State, changing lives by giving together. And by contributions from these and other Columbus area families who support WOSU. Thank you.